Hello from the World Economic Forum in Geneva. My name is Adrian Monk. Delighted to welcome you to this launch briefing for a new book from the forum, COVID-19, The Great Reset. I'm joined here in our studios in Geneva by the authors, Thierry Malloray, a former forum colleague, uh, and by Professor Klaus Schwab, who is the founder and executive chairman of the World Economic Forum and also by my colleague Sadia Zahidi, who leads the economic and societal work here in Geneva. Uh, before we hear from each of them, I want to turn over a couple of uh, rules of uh, housekeeping for the briefing. If you have questions, please use the Q&A function on Zoom and we'll try and move your question up. We'd love to hear from you in person. So if we work with our team behind the scenes, we can make sure that you can put your question live. Uh, if you have already put a question in, we'll turn to you very shortly. In the meantime, I want to start the briefing by hearing from uh, Klaus. And Klaus, perhaps you can introduce the book, its themes, and tell us what the objectives are for The Great Reset. Welcome, everybody, and thank you, Adrian. Let's first look at the impact COVID-19 probably has. We don't know yet. The final outcome of this pandemic, there's a lot of uncertainty, but we know already that it will have a changing effect, changing on uh, economies, societies. It's not just to be compared with the economic crisis which we had uh, to pass through uh, 10 years ago. Um, the effect will be much similar to uh, world war and actually all countries in the world are affected. So if we look at the impact, of course, uh, we first uh, uh, see uh, the impact on global economic growth, even in the most optimistic um, estimates of the IMF and OECD, um, we will be back to the output level of the end of 19 only at the, in the best case, only at the end of uh, 21. So look at the debt which we are uh, loading uh, on our shoulders. Uh, the world was already indebted at an amount of over 300% of GDP. Now um, the, the rescue programs of the governments represent another $10 trillion dollars which um, will be added to our debt load and will have to be, in some way, uh, be repaid by future generations. I'm also, of course, um, looking at uh, the unemployment which, uh, and uh, the impact on livelihoods. We know um, many, many people, according to the ILO, about 50% of people in the world will be affected combined, um, taking the combined effects of uh, COVID-19 and uh, the fourth industrial revolution. And finally, not to forget uh, the figures, I mean, we, we look at the statistics, we see uh, 500, more than 500,000 people who have died. Um, just imagine the personal tragedy which is behind all those cases. So we have to be very careful not just to look at the figures. Now, when we look at COVID, I think we should um, distinguish between three phases. We have the three R's, restrain, which means to fight the virus, the hot phase, most countries are in today. Then we have recover, to go back to a kind of new normal. And finally, the reset, which means to define and to design the strategies um, which uh, should lead us uh, in the after corona phase. Um, what is the objective? What kind of world do we want to build? What do we know? What did we learn? I think the world um, which uh, we want to create with the Great Reset has to be much more 
resilient. It has to be because security people will demand for more security. Um, physical security, health security, it will have to be more inclusive. Uh, we had already a big gap um, before the crisis started. This gap will be tremendously increased. So if we want to avoid uh, some kind of uh, social revolutions, and we have seen uh, the signs of anger on the streets uh, already the last weeks, um, so we have to address um, this issue to create a stronger inclusiveness. And finally, um, more sustainable, because um, uh, we know now uh, that um, the next crisis is already waiting for us around the corner, and it is the climate crisis. Um, the World Economic Forum, by the way, has uh, warned the world uh, uh, related to the um, to possible pandemics since years, and actually three of the major organizations uh, now in the fight against the virus, like um, the Global Fund, um, the um, particularly also CEPI, uh, all those organizations were uh, created in, in Davos. So we know that the next crisis uh, may come on us and we have to be better prepared. So what does it mean in practice? Five things, five priorities. The first one is we have to redefine our social contract to integrate more inclusion. Um, we also have to make sure that we integrate much more in a social contract our responsibility towards the next generation. We cannot just think of the debt, leave all the solutions and uh, to be paid for by the next generation. Um, so the social contract, and in the social contract, we also have to look at one specific issue. Um, so the COVID, will create again a gap between the so-called industrialized and emerging countries. Uh, the emerging countries, at least some of them, suffering much more uh, compared to some of the countries which have a well-established uh, social uh, safety net. Um, then second, so it's a social contract. Second, it's the decarbonization of the economy to protect us against uh, uh, a, uh, let's say, an environmental virus. Um, and here um, we will publish tomorrow, by the way, a report which shows clearly that there is no um, contradiction between taking care of nature and particularly uh, creating the need to, to create jobs and to invigorate the economy. Just to give you one figure, which um, um, we, uh, which has been calculated, um, if you take an investment of uh, 300 billion um, uh, dollars uh, or euros, it could create in the nature-based economy something around 400 million additional uh, jobs. So, social contract green economy but number three and that's a major part also of the book um, because you know i i published four years ago the book the fourth industrial revolution uh, all those technologies are very much advanced now by covid uh, everything will be digitalized which can be digitalized um, so uh, how can we use the technologies to address the challenges but at the same time, make sure that we create a, the necessary ethical, uh, human-oriented uh, principles around those technologies. So finally, what is the role of um, uh, companies in this new um, post-COVID era? I think we are moving from short-term to long-term, from um, shareholder capitalism to stakeholder capitalism. 
Uh, the COVID uh, crisis has shown that companies who invest into their vitality instead of prioritizing short-term profits have performed much better. And that's what the stakeholders will expect in the future. And I should um, uh, add uh, at last uh, the need for much stronger global cooperation. Uh, COVID has shown us that we are globally interdependent, and I think it's a wake-up call uh, to work in the future together uh, to address all the consequences and to create a reset in our economic, social, ecological thinking. Thank Klaus, you. Klaus, thank you very much. Uh, Thierry, you uh, co-wrote this, uh, this book. What are some of the major macro and micro impacts of the pandemic that you've observed? Thank you, Adrian. Well, the perspective we, we've adopted with uh, Professor Schwab is an all-encompassing all one. Um, so we decided to, to favor a holistic approach, considering that in today's world, it doesn't, doesn't make any sense to have a, a silo approach. Um, the reality is that the world is completely concatenated. So if just one word were to define today's world, it would be interdependence. We live in a world of systemic connectivity, meaning, meaning that the risks conflict with each other. So the main findings of the book, I think, pertain to the fact that uh, risks uh, create ricochet cascading effects. And um, we provide different examples um, in the book. Um, so for example, macro, um, if you use a simple framework to think about the world, if you consider uh, you know, macro categories in terms of eco economic risk or opportunities, geopolitical issues, societal issues, the environment, tax, or five big macro categories, you realize that each of them uh, has an effect on the others. So they cannot, they cannot be con considered in isolation from, from, uh, from each other. And let's take something that um, Klaus already uh, referred to, which is unemployment. So the crisis has triggered a precipitous rise in levels of unemployment. Unemployment creates strong societal risks. And we have already seen the uh, impact it is having in terms of social unrest worldwide. In terms of um, impoverishment, many, many emerging countries are now facing a dramatic situation in which um, an increasing level of uh, citizens will, will face um, deep poverty issues. Uh, with again, cascading effects in terms of, for example, involuntary migration, mass migration to uh, richer countries. Um, another one which is significant is the uh, increase in the rivalry that has uh, occurred between um, the United States and China. Uh, so a big ge geopolitical issue. And w what is apparent already from the uh, COVID pandemic is that um, it has acted as an accelerator of existing risks. So seeing that we're already uh, emerging um, a, a few a few years ago are now happening at a much faster pace than used to be the case. The environment, surprisingly, might be uh, one of the big um, winners from the pandemic, from the reasons that um, Professor Schwab just, just mentioned. Um, the pandemic has made all the more vivid the critical importance of natural assets. And it has made clear, for example, that there is a correlation between the um, infection rate and, uh, and air pollution. So as a result, we're now paying much more attention to um, the natural assets um, that are um, impacting uh, our, our life. And it is already clear that the 10 trillion um, of um, fiscal support that have been announced worldwide um, to deal with the pandemic, a significant portion of that, of this 10 trillion, will be um, conditional upon making the economy greener. Um, and in that respect, uh, Europe is very much at the forefront. Um, technology already has benefited um, from um, COVID and um, emerges as one of the clear winners, um, which comes with also a swathe of um, governance, privacy, and uh, intrusion issues, um, which might also affect, uh, affect individual liberties. Macro effects, I don't want to elaborate too much, but one of them, which we do, one which is very obvious, and uh, Professor Schwab already mentioned it, is the uh, extent to which the combination of societal and environmental risk is going to dramatically accelerate 
the transition towards ESG strategies and um, the share stakeholder economy progressively replacing the shareholder economy um, because that's the only way to deal with the looming issues that are ahead of us. Thierry, thank you for that. Sadia, you lead the work the forum does on a lot of the issues that lie behind uh, the factors identified by Klaus and Thierry in the book. How is the forum's work going to help support this theme of the Great Reset? Thank you. Thank you, Adrian. Um, a couple of broader points. You heard the five key priority areas from uh, Professor Schwab. Um, the regional action groups that the forum has set up are dealing with a lot of the elements of regional and global cooperation. The industry action groups that we have set up in the last months are dealing with the need for new business models within various industries. Our solutions platform on the fourth industrial revolution is looking at how to harness and disseminate better some of these technologies um, in the service of uh, positive societal outcomes. Um, our solutions platform on global public goods is looking at um, deploying more solutions around water, around the circular economy, around um, forestation. Um, and then finally, the solutions platform on the new economy and society um, is looking very much at what to do in terms of the economic growth and revival, two, um, wages, um, work and safety nets, uh, three, on education, skills and lifelong learning, and four, on diversity, equity and social justice. And perhaps let me just pick the first of those um, four categories. Um, I think it had been already quite some time that we needed to rethink where um, our sources of future growth would come from. And it had already been quite some time that we needed to look not just at the speed of growth, but also at the quality and direction of growth. We can no longer afford to look only at GDP metrics. We also need to be looking at what type of growth it is. So is it sustainable? Is it inclusive? And the forum will, over the coming year, be working on developing a new dashboard for this new economy so that we have the right kind of North Star to be driving towards. Of course, that then also necessitates looking at new tools of economic policy, new approaches to fiscal policy, new approaches to monetary policy, and we will be leading over the next months um, a global future councils that will be pulling together new ideas in these spaces. And again, some of these have been perhaps um, in the fringes of the academic conversation already. What we now need to do is bring those ideas to the fore because very much in the spirit of the Great Reset, this is the moment where we can proactively shape the economy that we want in the future. So that's one example from those four areas. Thanks very much. Um, thanks to all our panelists. Just turning out to uh, everyone listening, uh, if you have a question that you want to put to the panel, uh, then please use the Q&A function and we can get your question and uh, move you on to the panelists list in the webinar. We have a couple of questions to move to right now. I want to turn first to Asahi Shimbun from Japan and their correspondent Yu Yoshitake. Um, could you put your question, please? Uh, uh, can, you hear, uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, thank you for taking my question. Um, <clears throat> Uh, from Asahi Shimbun, uh, uh, the Japanese uh, newspaper. Uh, my question is how the forum uh, reflect this idea of uh, Great Reset uh, to its annual <coughs> annual excuse me uh, annual flagship flagship report, such as uh, Global Competitiveness Competitiveness Report and Global uh, Gender gap report. Is there any new criteria to be brought in these reports out of the experience of this COVID-19 pandemic? Thank you very much. Thanks for that. I think we just heard Sadia perhaps touch on some of the developments that we're likely to see, but um, we've also published a global risks report every January, which mm -hmm. sets a map for the year ahead and kind of identifies some of the uh, major issues that need to be on the five to 10 year horizon for, for policymakers. Um, and uh, Professor Schwab, to what extent will this great reset mean a great reset for some of those uh, flagship 
um, analyses of the global economy that's produced by institutions like the Forum? As you know, the Forum is a community of communities, a big global stakeholder communities, uh, community we integrate uh, governments, business, international organizations, civil society, our uh, young global leaders, our global shapers, and I could go on. Um, we are also involved into about um, 100 different activities or initiatives at this moment. All this will be integrated into a big work stream. Um, and uh, the Great Reset uh, will serve as, as a platform um, to integrate all the different stakeholders, to integrate all the different aspects. Uh, because if we talk about the Great Reset, we know we cannot uh, address all those issues in a very compartmentalized way. I think everything is interwoven. Uh, the fourth industrial revolution, for example, with the issue of the future of work, and so on and so on. Um, so, uh, our work uh, in the forum will be very much determined uh, by an effort to create new ideas, uh, to present those new ideas at the annual meeting um, uh, 21. Um, I want to highlight the book itself is much more an analysis of what's, what happened and what could happen and what will happen. Uh, but we have to find now the necessary responses. And here we need new innovative ideas and we have to integrate everybody into this process. It has to be an open process. So that's the reason why I'm so keen uh, to provide also a forward-looking dimension to this Great Reset Initiative by integrating the 10,000 uh, global shapers, leaders between 20 and 30 years uh, old, um, who not only leaders, I mean, they represent uh, society uh, in 400 different cities of the world. So, um, definitely, um, to, to be now precise in the response to your question, definitively the, um, the Global Competitiveness Report, uh, the Gender Parity Report, will be influenced by the other work and by our considerations related uh, to the uh, Great Reset Initiative. Thank you. And Sadi, you touched on a couple of the changes that will take place in some of the ways we evaluate economies because of this pandemic. Uh, is there scope for a bigger uh, reset of the metrics that organizations like the Forum use when we come to judge economies and performance? Yeah, I mean, you mentioned the um, global risk report, the competitiveness work, the gender gap work. There's also another key piece that's coming out later this year, which is our future of jobs report, another incredibly critical issue. And I think there are two elements. One is what do the metrics and the data tell us about the current state of those issues? But the second is where should we actually be setting those priorities? We can get a very good global landscape of what is happening, for example, to jobs across various economies and industries, but then where should the focus lie? And so the next stage from something like a benchmarking report on the future of jobs, the next stage is then to focus on what kind of reskilling and upskilling initiatives are needed, what kind of new social safety nets are needed to help workers through this transition, what kind of outlooks we can project in terms of where new jobs will come from. This cannot, cannot just be a zero-sum game that examines the jobs of today. It also has to take a focus on to what may be happening in the future. The care jobs, the health jobs, the education jobs, the nature economy jobs, the circular economy jobs, where we can find the next set of priorities. So I think similar to what I've just laid out on the future of jobs, similar to that when it comes to competitiveness, there are 12 pillars of competitiveness that we have been examining consistently over time. Those 12 pillars still remain incredibly important, but where the priorities lie in the future, having more um, a focus on innovation and developing new frontier markets, looking at where the future sources of jobs will come from, looking at uh, new possibilities in terms of taxation, developing greater capacity for future foresight within governments. Those will be some of the areas of future focus, although overall those 12 pillars will remain important. Thanks, Fan. Thierry, when you were researching and writing the book, 
were there metrics that you felt were missing that would really help illuminate the path ahead? Um, maybe data sets and, and uh, things that we should be measuring that you really felt that the world was kind of in need of? Well, um, Sadi already alluded to, to some of them. I would mention an extra one which emerged with um, strengths um, while writing the book, well-being. Well-being is now being used as a policy measure, as a policy tool in many countries around the world. And surprisingly, I mean, no, not surprisingly, and uh, it's highly correlated with um, women in power. Um, you know, New Zealand um, comes um, first and foremost to mind um, because of the well-being budget put into place by the Prime Minister. But many countries led by women uh, are indeed um, taking well-being uh, indicators into consideration and more and more countries around the world. Thanks for that. I want to turn, if I can, to uh, Vienna and to uh, editor of the Wiener Zeitung, uh, Thomas Seifert. Thomas, can we get a question from you, please? Yes, thank you very much for having me and thanks for putting us together in a virtual room, at least. Um, I, um, yeah, Professor Schwab, you've already brought it up that you expect a greater focus of political and economic elites uh, on the biggest threat to humanity, as you said, uh, even bigger than COVID, namely climate change. Uh, and also, Thierry, you have also mentioned that. So um, what do you think will the dynamics for tackling this issue come from? Will there be a push from governments, carbon tax comes to mind, or do you think uh, that it will come from the private sector? You have mentioned already keywords like sustainability, resilience, circular economy, just to mention a few keywords. And my second question is, there is not only the COVID crisis, but there is also an can maybe see an ideological shift uh, following the deepest recession or the Great Depression 2.0, call it what you will. And uh, you mentioned that there is a change in perception of the role of the state in the book that I saw as one of the chapters and also a change in perception of the consequence of social inequality, a topic that the forum brought up since several years. So I'm wondering what do you think about this change in political ideas and ideologies? Thank you very much. Thanks, Dr. Klaus. Yes, thank you very much for this question. Uh, let me start with the second one. Um, when we look at the tremendous challenge which we have uh, in creating this uh, Great Reset, um, I think all stakeholders of uh, global society are challenged. What we have seen um, was a kind of, uh, how shall I say, dominance of uh, business in global affairs uh, in the last, uh, at least in the last two decades. Now this is balancing out. We have uh, the return of government, uh, government even taking uh, participation in government, in, uh, in companies, in any case, um, attaching um, uh, conditions at uh, safeguarding uh, measures. Uh, so, um, what does it mean for us and for our approach? I think uh, we will succeed only if it's a completely open platform. Um, it cannot be uh, governments alone, it cannot be uh, business alone. If you look at the issue of um, uh, environment, even if you look at the issue of creation of vaccines or remedies and so on, it's always a cooperation between governments, business, and I think it has to be supported by the great public, uh, by civil society. For us, very important is uh, to have a forward-looking voice, because um, if you take the medium age of uh, the global population, which is below 30 years old, um, here we talk about long-term perspectives, um, and we have to engage the young generation. And also, not only the enthusiasm and also support, uh, but also the ideas of the young generation. For this reason, by the way, uh, following up uh, also in the framework of our cooperation with the UN, uh, the Forum has created a digital platform, which is called AppLink. Um, and this is a platform aiming at integrating the young generation entrepreneurial ideas uh, behind uh, the 17 different SDGs. So what, what are innovative ideas of the young generation related to global warming um, and all the other 
let's say, global uh, challenges uh, which, uh, which we have. Um, related uh, to your first question, um, yes, uh, I, I already integrated it into my answer. Um, it's, a, it's necessary to have a very open approach. Uh, this cannot be a response of elites to concerns of uh, the great public. Um, I think uh, we, we are at a, at a rupture point where um, we have to make sure uh, that we have a comprehensive, all-inclusive approach. Otherwise, we will just um, be confronted with a climate of social unrest um, and um, uh, possibly revolts uh, on the streets or revolts from the next generation. Thanks, Thierry. Um, we've, the last 50 years, we've seen governments since Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan saying that they had to step back and let business step forward. This crisis seems to have reversed that dynamic. How uh, important going forward will it be for governments to keep that leadership role and to step up in the face of the crisis? Well, it's going to be critical, and um, you know, as Professor Schwab just mentioned, in fact, we look at government, we, we have a very black and white the perception of government and, and the, the private sector in reality is to cooperate in a very um, intensive intensive manner. Now we are at an inflection point. It's changing. The, the ideology that has prevailed over the past 15 years, which um, was predicated upon um, the government having as little role as possible, um, is changing radically. And moving forward, you should expect um, the government to take a more um, active role in um, in the economy and in societal issues, but it doesn't have to be big government. It can be a smarter government, and uh, smarter government will mean um, will mean a very um, you know, intricate collaboration between uh, government, civil society, uh, and the private sector. Class, I think when we when we address all those issues, innovation, creativity is very important. And we know um, uh, innovation and uh, creativity doesn't come normally uh, or always from, from governments. It's mainly entrepreneurship. So we should not underestimate the role of entrepreneurship in addressing all those issues. So on the one hand, we have to create uh, probably uh, or certainly more um, social uh, safety nets. Uh, the government is very much challenged. We may have to look at uh, our uh, at, um, fiscal systems, um, but we always have to keep in mind not uh, to, to restrict uh, the entrepreneurial spirit of business. So it's a fine balance between the two. On the one hand, uh, to, to, to have the necessary rules. On the other hand, to ensure uh, that uh, the economy is thriving based on uh, entrepreneurship and uh, based on uh, markets. Thanks for that. I um, want to go to uh, Delhi and uh, to Pranjal Sharma, who's both a columnist for the Business Standard, but also one of the leading authors and commentators on the fourth industrial revolution there. Uh, Pranjal, your question. Uh, thank you, Adrian. Uh, I'd also like to uh, congratulate uh, Professor Schwab and Thierry because I read the, uh, some of the chapters of the book in advance and I'm going to be reviewing it. But my main question is, you know, Professor Schwab, you've always been uh, arguing for uh, preparing and shaping the fourth industrial revolution. But if uh, COVID is accelerating everything, how do we accelerate the preparation? Because I don't think our systems, industries, and policymakers have yet come to grip uh, with, uh, with the fourth industrial revolution even before COVID. But now it seems like uh, a crisis. While there are, of course, positives, but I think the ability to cope with this accelerated change is limited. We have, if we look at the present situation, we have. Uh, actually three interrelated uh, situations. Uh, first, we have the impact of COVID. Uh, second, we should not forget that after 
a long period of economic growth, we were entering a, um, a period of, I would say recession, but of reduced economic growth, just taking the economic cycles. And then you have the fourth Siddhas revolution, which as I wrote in the book four years ago, when I coined the expression, the fourth industrial revolution, which has a tremendous impact um, on business models, on society, and on the economy. And you're right. Um, the, as we described also in the book, um, many of those technologies just look at uh, face recognition, just look at the technologies which you need for uh, tracking people and so on. But then look also what we are seeing now with some of the companies engaged into the research for vaccines using completely um, new methods uh, based on synthetic biology. Uh, so I, my, my worry, no, my, my observation is uh, that those um, technology advance fast. Look also at uh, the uh, uh, valuation uh, of, of uh, the leading companies at the stock exchanges. My concern in the, in, in related to this question is, uh, are we able, we always need for technologies also to, to create the necessary, um, I wouldn't call it regulations, but at least uh, ethical ground rules. How can we use those technologies that they are used for the benefit of humankind and not just for the benefit for one application or one specific companies? Uh, you see it in the whole discussion um, uh, related uh, to, to some of uh, the leading companies, uh, to how to find the balance between, let's say, responsible behavior on the one hand and um, applying the technology fully. Um, so this is something which uh, the forum will, is already with this network um, of uh, centers for force industrial revolution, looking at how can we promote those technologies to provide solutions. We have been very active, also actively involved in the whole question of uh, vaccines. How can we promote those technologies, but on the other hand, make sure that those technologies are not used at the detriment of humankind? Great stuff. I want to turn to Malaysia in a moment and to uh, Kamarul Haron from Astro Awani. Uh, before I do, I just want to check if Kamarul can hear us. Um, and if he's just setting up his uh, microphone, then we will um, just briefly turn to Sadia Zahidi on that point about the fourth industrial revolution that Pranjal made on preparedness. Mm. How is the preparedness that we've seen for that technology impact, how is that translating into action or inaction in respect of COVID-19 and the response we've seen there? Sure. Let me try to give you maybe a practical example of the type of work we've been doing over the last um, couple of years and how that evolved in the current moment. So we had set up uh, what we call closing the skills gap accelerators with 10 countries that were piloting with us the response to the fourth industrial revolution in terms of reskilling and upskilling. With the pandemic, with the lockdown, and with the massive impact that it has had on jobs within those economies, we actually pivoted very quickly and won how do we deploy the fourth industrial revolution technologies to actually give people better skills. And so we were able to bring in a number of online learning and training platforms to work with those governments to actually deploy very rapidly the skills that their workforce needed. Um, second, work on rapid redeployment. People may be furloughed in one industry or in one particular company, but those very same skills are needed in other high demand parts of the economy, whether that's in healthcare or logistics. So very quickly help them with rapid redeployment. And third, work with them very quickly on the data that is required to focus on future jobs. And again, deploying fourth industrial revolution technologies to understand where those future jobs will come from. So that's sort of one practical example where we were able to work with various economies to actually support them in their workforce challenges. And Thierry, you've obviously followed the work on the fourth industrial revolution very closely after, over the past few years. 
uh, both as someone on uh, on the on the outside and someone who follows economic trends uh, very comprehensively. To what extent has preparedness for the fourth industrial revolution translated into action or inaction in respect of this pandemic? Have we seen people, because of advances like the ones Klaus has been talking about, because of the ones that uh, Saadi has been talking about, in a better position now to develop some of the tools we need to face the crisis? Or have we not taken advantage of the kind of warning that we've heard from people like Klaus uh, to get our acts together in, in the last few years? Well, what has been staggering with with tech is uh, celerity of the response. And so in terms of preparedness, what has been made very, very clear about the uh, pandemic is um, the rapidity with which the tech industry is capable of reacting to a particular situation. And um, now the uh, issue is uh, more an issue of governance, how the progress is going to be managed from a policy perspective. And, uh, an ability from the industry itself to act with celerity. Thanks for that. Just trying to see now if we've got uh, communications with Camerul in Malaysia from Astro Awani. I can see you, Camerul. I don't know if we can hear you. Do you want to just try and say something to us? Yes. No, I think we've uh, gone to a freeze frame on Camerul's feed. We'll try and come back to him a little later on. Um, just going forward, we're going to continue to see fallout from this crisis and some of the structural changes that it brings about for better and worse. What are the principal positive structural changes that you expect to see? We've talked a lot about the potential risks and the damage. What are some of the positive structural changes you think will come out of this crisis, Klaus? I think for me it's the final transition from uh, short-term thinking to more long-term thinking and from shareholder capitalism to stakeholder capitalism. Um, I think it's also uh, the transition, as it has been mentioned, from looking at um, material um, improvement of life to a more generalized uh, concept of uh, well-being, uh, translated on a corporate level into uh, ESG measurement, uh, environmental, social, and good governance criteria. And one of the big, um, as an example, one of the big projects which we have uh, in the framework of this Great Reset Initiative is uh, to come up with a more unified measurement system uh, to allow to evaluate companies not only on the basis of short-term uh, financial returns, but um, how they perform in terms of social, uh, environmental, and good governance uh, criteria. So those are uh, two aspects. I think a third aspect is, and it has been mentioned in our discussion, I think is the need uh, to address those issues um, uh, from a, if I take a, a, a country uh, level or even if I take the international level, um, so that we have a dialogue integrating all global uh, stakeholders uh, into uh, the discussion. So I want to take a question, if I can, from the United States, uh, from Taye Pan. Uh, Taye, I hope I've pronounced your name correctly. Can you give us your question? Hi. Um, thank you for hosting this amazing um, program. Uh, the times are really crazy, and this is the new normal, and it's hard to, to navigate. But my question is, um, looking at the educational um, sector, you know, what is the future of education um, post COVID-19? And looking at Africa to be precise, how does Africa play into the future of education post COVID-19, especially considering the fact that Africa lacks the kind of infrastructure to support um, online schooling, like the challenge of internet, the challenge of electricity and power supply in Africa, and even the challenge of um, um, the kind of crisis um, we're talking about, like terrorism in countries like Nigeria, the Lake Chad Basin, 
and all of that. How does this play into the future of education um, in developed countries, developing countries post-COVID-19? Thanks so much for that question. I think one of the uh, biggest impacts that we've seen societally is the impact on children and young people and the fact that they've been denied the opportunity to be in face-to-face -face education with their peers and teachers. Um, Klaus Thierry, how do you see that impact translated into uh, what Taye said is one of the most uh, you know, challenged continents in terms of infrastructure, in terms of electricity, in terms of abilities? You've talked both about the problems and the opportunities. On the one hand, there is a huge opportunity presented by the online provision of learning, but somewhere where there's no uh, internet, where there's no electricity, this is also presenting huge problems. Yeah, we, we talk here about, uh, let's say, the delivery and the delivery system. And uh, the two pillars uh, for, let's say, um, economic policies um, in the future, or two key, uh, key pillars, have to be uh, to create the necessary uh, digital um, infrastructure. And of course, what I said before, the decarbonization of, of the economy. So those are the two, the green economy and the digital economy. Um, we, we certainly, and uh, we, we also are involved since many years in how we can help particularly African countries um, to deploy uh, the necessary digital infrastructure. I think um, uh, there are some countries with which we work together very closely or have worked together. But uh, coming back to the essence of your question, I feel that the industry, if I make use of the industry, most uh, changing in the coming years is education. And I would see it, provided we solve the infrastructure question, I would see it not just as a threat, um, I would see it as a great opportunity. I think we, we, we have seen the combination of, um, uh, let's say, education as we are used to, and digital education is probably uh, the best way um, to, to prepare um, uh, people. Um, for the requirements of life, but it's also um, lifelong education. And here, um, as my colleague um, um, already mentioned, um, Sadia, uh, the, the issue of skills, um, and skills can be best probably taught on a large scale by digital methods, but maybe you may uh, elaborate on it. Sure. Um, first, let me completely second that, um, that at the education sector as a whole uh, has perhaps not gone through uh, the type of changes that have been required for several decades. And now, finally, is this opportunity to reset um, according to what we're describing as Education 4.0, which means changing the content of education so that it is much more relevant for the 21st century economy, and second, changing the delivery methods. And while it's absolutely critical that we have the digital infrastructure in place, it also requires a hybridization. We do need to have the in-person schooling, the in-person learning, but we also need to have the online systems available. And that hybridization is an aspect that is frankly lacking in most developed and developing economies and something that we'll be working with multiple countries and um, uh, industries on. Terry, I mean, despite the huge technical and infrastructural challenges of educational delivery online, is this also an opportunity to perhaps equalize some of the credentialing that's been uh, undermining uh, education for so long, where reputations have been built uh, and fee structures set without necessarily a relationship being established between them and the provision of the educational content? Absolutely. And it's being made very vivid at the moment um, in terms of the debate raging in the US regarding the fees in higher education when most likely uh, many students will not be able to participate um, physically in person um, in the first quarter, um, possibly beyond that, uh, courses. 
Um, so this um, issue is uh, bubbling at the moment and very much going to the direction that you just mentioned. Thanks for that. I think we can now go to Malaysia and to Astra Wani and Kamarul Haron. Kamarul. Yes. Yes, hi. Um, okay. My first question is, um, the deep inequalities has clearly been exposed and further highlighted by the pandemic. What will it take for the Great Reset to be started immediately with the COVID-19 vaccine? A, multi, a multilateral stakeholder capitalism approach to not just for the research and the trials, but also to the manufacturing and distribution of the coming vaccine to ensure that the whole world has access to it, not just the have versus the, the have not. Because if we look at like diseases before, like hepatitis C, the cost was about maybe 3,200, uh, 30, 32,000 US dollars for uh, a developing nation like Malaysia for a whole regime of treatment, when now with generic drugs, uh, that can be done with only about uh, uh, 200 uh, US dollars. Second question is very simple. It's about politics. We have seen during the pandemic uh, handling that uh, politicians refused to listen to science from uh, the developed nation right down to developing nation. So. That was a great end to great reset. Yeah, um, Camera, we'll try. I'll try and put those uh, points to Klaus. I think I've got a, a written version of, of what you wanted to uh, to say there. Um, in the first case, Klaus, obviously, vaccine distribution is going to be a huge test if we get a vaccine of that great reset philosophy, because we're going to see if it really uh, comes to pass that it's distributed equally and fairly around the world, or if it goes into the hands of those best resourced and wealthiest. So how do we make sure and what can we do to encourage the kind of cooperation needed to make sure that globally the people who need this vaccine the most get it? Um, and also, how do we strengthen what seems to be a broken relationship between uh, politics and, and science at the moment? I cannot give you a guarantee that egoism will not prevail at the end. I think um, when you are faced with a crisis, um, uh, the natural tendency is to put you first. And uh, that's what we are witnessing uh, certainly in the world today. I only can say that the, the World Economic Forum in many practical ways is engaged into efforts just to prevent the situation you were referring to. And I would say being quite involved in those discussions, um, it's even aggravated by the, by the question um, about the vaccine itself. We don't know yet, uh, for example, is one dose sufficient? Uh, do you need two doses? In what interval? Uh, do you have even uh, to, to be vaccinated every year um, because the antibodies may not um, uh, sustain for a long time? So uh, it's a big unknown. And I just can uh, assure you uh, we, we will try. I mean, that's our, uh, our role uh, to look at the solutions in the best global interest. And I think the best global interest is not to increase the divide between the haves and the haves not, between those countries which are industrialized and those uh, which are lagging behind. But let me make one, one remark here. I, I think if we look at um, uh, the location of uh, the production um, facilities for uh, vaccines, they are very much uh, not in the industrialized countries. They are in, if I'm not mistaken, they are in your country, in Malaysia. Uh, they are in India, particularly, and so on. So this is really a test case where um, uh, for, for the capability of global cooperation. And one of the second points touched upon, Thierry, by, um, excuse me, by uh 
camera rule there was the relationship between politics and science and in a sense that relationship perhaps is is the politicians siding with some of the popular opinion that doesn't seem to want to listen to some of the science that's going on out there how does that relationship get rebalanced how do we restore the trust between the public the politicians and the scientists well, it's an exceedingly difficult question um i don't know how you do it but what is apparent already is that um the greatest winner of the COVID pandemic is expertise. Um, you know, when you pay attention to um, what has made some countries very successful at dealing with the pandemic or less successful, it's the uh, first and foremost, the uh, capability of the uh, national leaders to rely upon the um, opinion of experts. Um, so expertise is back. And this is also, by the way, the reason why uh, the environment, uh, the environmental issues have come to the forefront and uh, there is more um, sensitivity being paid to um, natural assets, the environment, climate change, etc. So expertise is back. Klaus? No, um, nothing to add at the moment. Uh, um, we've got about four minutes left on this briefing. Um, I want to see if we can turn over to uh, Farah Akili at the University of Florida. Farah, have we got you on the line? Hi, hello. Um, thank you all for this um, talk. I really enjoyed it. My question uh, to all of you would be, um, being an urban planner, uh, what do you think our cities um, would look like, let's say 10 years, 20 years from now? What should be uh, our main focus? Uh, knowing the shift in paradigm, uh, thinking about um, uh, sustainability and resiliency uh, nowadays. Uh, my, my second question, uh, if I may ask, um, how do you think um, the um, response to refugees and refugee issues uh, should be uh, going forward as well? Thanks Thank for that. You. We don't have a lot of time left on our call, but I'll, I'll uh, call on each of our panelists if I can for a very uh, quick answer to those questions. Uh, and Klaus, I mean, cities famously are vertical, um, and perhaps this pandemic means they'll be more horizontal. What do you think the impact will be on, on the way we, we manage urban life going forward? We don't know yet, but um, we can assume uh, that there will be a de-urbanization and people uh, will have some kind of a tendency uh, to prefer a, a rural environment again more to the, um, let's say, accumulation of, of people. Um, as far as the refugees are concerned, um, I, I think uh, here we are mainly in a situation of restraint. We have to make sure that, uh, particularly, that's one of the big worries, uh, the refugee camps, um, we do not have too many infections because with the accumulation of people, this would be really a major uh, human uh, disaster. Let me just, since we are coming at the end, uh, uh, let me just uh, conclude um, by saying uh, we are at a, a turning point of humankind. I think we should not underestimate uh, the historical significance um, of the situation uh, we are in. Um, we know the world will look differently um, when we move out, hopefully as soon as possible, um, from the acute um, phase of uh, the virus into um, a new situation. Now, we have three options for the new situation. Uh, the first one is that all the negative aspects which we have seen during the crisis, and I refer to the egoism which has uh, increased um, I would say on an international, national, but also, let's face it, on an individual level, that uh, these negative tendencies will even increase, will continue, and um, uh, I don't want to be uh, too much uh, a pessimist, but um, I, 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 I would say in this case, uh, I'm very concerned about the life of uh, my grandchildren. 
The second situation is that people assume uh, we are just going back uh, to the good old world which we had um, and everything will be normal again in how we are used to normal in the old fashion. This is, uh, let's say, fiction. It will not happen. Um, the the uh, cut which we have now um, is much too strong uh, in order not to leave traces. And then we have the third possibility um, to construct a new uh, concept um, based um, on the learnings, um, on the observations um, we, we have seen, and to create really, and I come back, a more um, resilient, a more inclusive, and a more sustainable world. So some people may say this is too idealistic, um, but what other choice do we have? At least we have to try. Uh, we may fail, um, and um, next generations, or even we ourselves, will have to pay the price, price for our failure. At least we should try it. And I can uh, just uh, promise you on behalf of uh, the forum, of, the, uh, of our partners uh, in governments, business, civil society, and so on, uh, on behalf of my colleagues, in, we will try to we will try um, uh, to, to be on the constructive side, um, and um, it will be an interesting journey, a journey with, which probably will last for quite some time. Uh, the annual meeting will be a major factor in it, so I'm looking forward uh, to continue this discussion with you, and hopefully to continue the discussion by showing that we make maybe only small, but at least we make progress. Klaus, thank you. Um, we're out of time on today's briefing. We've run just a little bit over. I'm sorry if we haven't had time to take your question. If you wanna go deeper into all of the issues we've been talking about for the last hour, just go to Amazon and look for COVID-19, The Great Reset by Klaus Schwab and Thierry Malloray. That's COVID-19, The Great Reset. You'll find it on Amazon as an ebook, or you can order it as a paperback. Uh, it's there. It's a great summer vacation read. It'll make you look like the most serious person on the beach. Um, <laughs> thanks to Klaus, Thierry, and Sadia for joining. Klaus, perhaps the last word from you? No, just uh, uh, all you come directly to me and to us, and we share it, uh, of course, with you. Um, um, without going through uh, Amazon, if necessary. Absolutely. There's a, an original Word and PDF available uh, yep. direct from, from the author. So thanks again for joining and uh, appreciate your time and commitment to being with us today. Thanks, everyone.